And uh, Dr. Chabana, I am thrilled to have you here. I, I think your work and what you have done is brilliant. It's, it's, um, it's exciting to see what you have done because I can imagine taking the life experience of the grandmothers and just being there to, to listen and to have some training. So I, I'm so thrilled that you're here. So welcome. Thank you. I am, I'm honored to be here and happy to, to share my story with you all. I'm looking forward to the next hour. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, first off, we'd love to hear a little more about you. Like where, where did you come from and what led you to wanting to be a psychiatrist? Great question. So I trained as a medical doctor in the Czech Republic. And while I was training to become a medical doctor, a very close friend took his own life by suicide. His name was Zef, and no one really expected Zef to take his own life. This was the kind of person who was bubbly, was always there for others, always full of energy. And, and, and just like that, one evening, bang, he jumped from the 20th floor of, uh, of the building where he lived and died. It was only after he died that we realized that Zef had been struggling with, uh, with depression. So that was when I really started thinking about mental health, you know, um, it got me thinking. And when I got back home in Zimbabwe, I, um, I think partly because of that experience, I decided to, to focus on psychiatry and while I was still in my formative years as a psychiatrist, I lost a client of mine to suicide. Erica was her name. I talk extensively about Erica in my TED talk. Um, and Erica took her own life at a time when I actually thought she was doing well. Um, and But the reason why she took her own life was because she actually couldn't afford uh, the bus fare, the bus fare to come to the hospital where I worked. Um, so Erica knew she needed help, but she didn't have, you know, $10, $10, the equivalent of 10 US dollars to get on a bus to come to the hospital to talk to me where I worked. And when I heard the story about Erica from Erica's mother and the reason why Erica didn't come to the hospital, uh, it just broke my heart. It, it got me in a, in a state of soul searching. And it was then that I realized that I had to find a way of taking mental health to the community. And that really was the beginning of, uh, of, of the friendship bench. Um, I'll stop there before I carry on because I can carry on rumbling like forever, you know, so I'll just give some space uh, in case you have some very specific questions around what I've just shared, yeah. Well, I uh, really appreciate you sharing, you know, that hits home deeply to many of us on this call. And, and I had forgotten about that. I think I saw that video about four or five years ago. And then I've been watching so many of the other videos of yours that I forgot about that story. Um, but I'll tell you, you are speaking our language. We have all suffered through the loss of, of um, close ones, you know, taking their life. So I do very much understand how that changes a person's life. And that makes a lot of sense why you would be such a standout with creative solutions. And I, I really appreciate you sharing that, that, that definitely touches home. Um, so I, I would love to hear then again, just about the friendship bench, how this, this, these tragedies morphed into the friendship bench. Yeah. So after the death of, of Erica, um, not only did I re realize that there was a need to take mental health to the community, but I was suffering. I suddenly got into this, um, you know, uh, feeling of not being adequate, you know, imposter syndrome. I, I blamed myself for Erica's death for a very long time. And part of my journey 
towards community mental health was really, to be quite honest, almost, um, not almost, it definitely was, um, my way of escaping from the pain, the tragedy of Erica's death, particularly after Erica's mother came to visit me, you know, after her death, the guilt, you know, this, uh, the, the animosity that I felt was just overwhelming. I remember Erica's mother walking in to my little consultation room um, and she sat there um, and, and the only thing I could do is cry. And, and interestingly, you know, interestingly, you know, at that moment, you know, ironically, at that moment, the tables turned and Erica's mother almost became the therapist because it was her who had to say, it's okay to cry, my child, you know, and that's, those were exactly her words. Um, and, <laughs> And, you know, I still remember the two of us sobbing <laughs> in my little consultation room. And, you know, I had mixed feelings of both guilt, embarrassment, shame, and, and just to total, utter failure as a professional, you know. Um, and after that incident, I, I wanted to remove myself from that uh, environment um, and... And I, I, I realized that one way of removing myself was to spend a lot more time in the community exploring how I was going to bring mental health to the community. I had no idea how it was going to happen, you know, but I realized that one of the resources that we had at community level, which was constant, and readily available was, you know, the community of these, these grandmothers, you know, this army of grandmothers who are always in their communities, who are, you know, the custodians of the local culture and the local wisdom. You know, let me tell you something about Africa that you might not know. In Africa, we have a term that we use to describe elderly people who are kind of trained to become storytellers. The word we use to describe them is griot, G-R-I-O-T. A griot is an elderly African who is a storyteller, uh, also trained to sing, to, to, to tell, to share poems, you know, poetry and things like that. And these grandmothers, uh, griots, you know, if you like, for lack of a better word. Um, in the Western world, we would describe them as counselors, you know, or lay counselors. But in our part of the world, you know, the, the, they are griots because they have this rich knowledge and wisdom and they are anchored in their communities. And I realized, you know, that I could actually equip these grandmothers with the skills in basics, in basic cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, allocate them a wooden park bench in their community and um, facilitate referrals to these wooden park benches through the local primary healthcare facilities, police stations and, and, and places like that. And they could actually provide therapy in the community. And that's how Friendship Bench really started with, with 14 grandmothers. And, and of course, I, I was really so desperate to get this going when once I had the idea um, and, and I, didn't have, uh, I didn't have the money to do it. And so when Friendship Bench actually first started with the first 14 grandmothers, I used my own money, you know, my own um, salary as a government psychiatrist, which, which is not a lot of money, actually. Uh, so I used my own salary to get this thing going with these um, 14 grandmothers. And, uh, and you know, when I look at uh, the early days of Friendship Bench, I think it's one of the best things that I've ever done uh, in my life for purely selfish reasons, again, because it taught me how to be comfortable with being vulnerable because 
interacting with those 14 grandmothers made me realize how vulnerability can actually be a strength because every single week me and the grandmothers we would meet we would talk about the the different stories coming out of the community um the different cases that they were managing on 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 the bench on the friendship bench and it was with these grandmothers i think almost three four years after the death of erica that i finally opened up about erica's death and when i shared erica's death with the grandmothers and how it had affected me and how I was living with this, this, this heavy weight that I was carrying on my shoulders. You know, the interesting thing is the grandmothers, initially, these 14 grandmothers, they didn't say anything. And after a few minutes, they decided to pray for me. And after praying, they sang a song. Now imagine 14 grandmothers who have spent decades singing together, suddenly breaking off in this soothing, therapeutic uh, harmony. You know, um, it was so amazing that you know that just that that actual uh event itself just suddenly released me you know and I, I found that very intriguing because they didn't have to say anything all they had to do is pray and sing for me and i felt this release of course, after that, you know, I um, we we did talk quite a lot subsequently. But the beginning, um, you know, was really marked by those two main activities: prayer and and a song. You know, um, and so as I indicated, you know, these these griots in um, in in African culture, they have this amazing ability to to not only tell stories and uh, and help guide people who are. Um, you know, lost or who feel lost, but they are also um, uh, they also are able to to sing in in this most soulful, graceful way, which in itself can be uh, amazingly therapeutic. That is that's beautiful, boy. I had to hold back the tears on that story. That is it's so beautiful. It just you know the whole story reminds me of just beauty coming from ashes. Something you know, so heart wrenching that happened to you. And even the sense of responsibility that you felt. And yet, um, you know, the mother coming in and comforting you, and then you going, you pivoting and looking for a different way to try to solve this problem. And just the beautiful way that the griots, is that griots? Um, yeah handled this uh gosh it's we have so much to learn you know it's it's such a beautiful way that they handled this and um i'm just i'm i'm so touched and i really appreciate you sharing this uh because i think you know the people on this call and the people who watch these videos are proactive we want to help those that are struggling with mental health and so can you tell us some, maybe some specific stories that have come out, like maybe the griots have shared with you, um, just certain stories of people healing just, just by being able to talk on a friendship bench? Yeah. Um, so there had been, you know, one of the problems that uh, a lot of folks face in this part of the world is, um, uh, you know, just uh, poverty, you know, people struggle to get, um, to get food. Um, and, you know, I always believed, I always thought that poverty was um, brought about by a lack of resources, be it material resources, or financial resources. I mean, that is part of the problem. But one of the things that I learned from the grandmothers is that there are two kinds of poverty. There's poverty of the mind 
and poverty of material things. If you have poverty of both the mind and, and resources, you are doomed to stay in that, in that poverty hole or pit, whatever you want to call it. You know, and, um, and, and the grandmothers, when I started working with these grandmothers, you know, I was, you know, coming in from uh, a very sort of um, westernized uh, way of thinking, you know, using these um, these frameworks, these frameworks developed in, uh, you know, in the developed world, because when you train as a psychiatrist, you train according to frameworks that are developed in, in places like America and Europe, you know. Um, but the grandmothers were were quick, you know, to remind me of the importance of leveraging uh, community idioms of distress and community language, you know. And so I remember this very one particular case the way the grandmothers, one of the grandmothers, um, you know, was, you know, and this was actually grandmother Wiza, or one of the, the longest serving grandmothers at the Friendship Bench, grandmother Wiza, who has a fascinating story, and I can share that with you maybe later. But grandmother Wiza was uh, sharing, uh, you know, uh, a case, because we we meet every Tuesday, you know, to, to, to debrief, you know, um, to just, um, support each other, um, you know. So I, I've continued to to meet the the original grandmothers that I started this work with. There are only eight of them left now, you know. Um, quite a number of them have died. Um, I can't. I'd love to 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 interact with all the grandmothers, but I can't because we now have more than two thousand grandmothers, you know. So so I I at least you know make sure that every week I I will meet with my you know, original grandmothers, and from time to time, I'll meet other grandmothers. So grandmother Weasel was sharing a story about this young woman who had come to the bench after she'd been re referred by one of the nurses at the primary healthcare facility. And this young lady presented with, um, you know, with, um, with a number of challenges, you know, she 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 was in an abusive relationship. Um, she was um, going to get her ten year old because she didn't have, one, and um, she also was struggling to feed her family. You know, so she has all these problems that she presents with at the at the bench, and she she also scored very high on our screening tool. So that's the other thing that we do at the bench. The grandmothers are taught how to use you know, um, these locally validated screening tools. Um, one of the screening tools that you, that's used globally is called the PHQ-9, which helps to screen if somebody has depression. So the grandmothers are taught how to use that screening tool. They also use the GAD-7 for anxiety. Um, and we also use a screening tool for PTSD. So they are taught to use these screening tools. So the grandmother administered these tools, and and she found that this um, this uh, this young mother uh, actually had uh, a very high score on the PHQ, suggesting that she had depression. You know, she had depression, and uh, when you know when typically every story at the friendship bench starts off with the grandmother saying to the client, "Would you like to share your story with me?" That's how everything starts at the bench. And when, when that story comes out, the grandmother is noting what are the key elements of that story. And um, so this, this client presents with these set of, of challenges. And then the grandmother sort of summarizes what she hears and throws it back at the client. And what typically happens on the friendship bench is when a person presents with a lot of problems, naturally, they don't know which problem to select. And we call that the ping pong at the friendship bench because you get this exchange between the client and the grandmother where the grandmother gives this summary and, and asks the client to, to select one problem that they would like to start working on. And often clients don't know which problem to, to work on. And they will say, no, grandmother, you decide for me which, which problem I should focus. And the grandmother says, I can't decide which problem to focus on because I possibly cannot stand in your shoes. 
I want you to decide and then I will help you to work through that problem. So you have this exchange. And finally, when she decides, you know, to, to focus on a problem, this young mother, she says she actually wants to focus on her child. She wants to make sure that her 10-year-old daughter is going to school. You know, so she's not interested about her own HIV status. You know, she's not interested about getting medication. She's not interested at, um, at addressing the fact that she is in an abusive relationship where her husband beats her up. She's not interested in addressing the issue of um, not having enough food to feed her family. She wants her 10-year-old daughter to go to school, you know. And, and when we zero in, you know, when she zeroed in as to why she wanted the 10-year-old daughter to go to school. What she said was, because if my daughter is at school, I can solve all these other problems. If my daughter is not at school, I'm constantly worried and I have to be with her because I fear she will be sexually abused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, you know, you begin to understand how people select problems that they feel I a priority, you know, um, looking at this particular problem as a, as a medical doctor, I would have thought, hey, we need to fix the HIV issue and then we need to sort of fix the, uh, the abuse issue. You're, in a, you're, you're in, a, in a relationship which is abusive. But in her own mind, she realized that she can fix all these other issues if this issue with her, with her daughter is sorted out, if her daughter spent you know the eight hours at school that all the kids spend in this particular community she can spend eight hours problem solving around all these other issues you know so that was a very beautiful story and uh, and so what the grandmother did was she actually physically went to the school with the mother and uh, reassured the school head that he should take this daughter give us two weeks, we will find the money to come and pay for the school fees for this child to continue, you know, and so this child went back to school, and the, the mother continued to have sessions with the grandmothers, and collectively they brainstormed around how they would raise the $15. Again, it's never a lot of money, but for people who are in poverty, it's it's a hell of a lot of money. $15 to pay for a child to go to school, that's like um, for each semester. You know, this mother didn't have the $15. And they problem solved around that with a the grandmother. They realized that the, this mother could uh, put actually sell um, vegetables, um, uh, she could sell tomatoes, she could sell a couple of things to raise that $15 within that two week period. And that's exactly what happened. And once she started doing all of that, she then started addressing all these other issues. As we speak, she's on medication now for her HIV, her viral load has gone down, you know, and she's thriving. She has moved um, out of that um, a relationship that she was in and she's got her own place she's staying on her own you know so it's a it's a it's a beautiful story you know of how um you know we should never assume that what we think is a problem uh, you know when we hear a set of problems presented by a person what we think is what we should be focused on might be completely different from what they want to focus on yeah i'll stop there oh my gosh that's be i'm so inspired I mean, everything about that, I mean, just the training of the grandmothers, like you just said, helping to empower them to choose their own problem that they want help to solve. Um, what a great story. I mean, just this whole idea just hits me to the core of, of a beautiful, you know, way to do things. I mean, I just, that's kind of what we do in the power of our story. We do believe that, you know, we heal in, in healthy community and it's, it's just amazing. It's amazing what you have built. And I, I don't want to be selfish with this time and not in, you have everybody come in here. So I'm going to just open it up for comments and questions. Uh, but Dr. Chibanda, I, I just, I, I cannot tell you how, um, exciting it is to hear about this because it just makes so much sense to me. Um, yeah. So anyway, thank you so much for that.
It's a pleasure. It's a, it's a pleasure. You know, one of the things that um, I've learned over the past couple of years working with the grandmothers is um, is that it doesn't really matter if you are a psychiatrist, a psychologist, if you're trained as a as a, a CBT therapist, whatever it is, whatever you want to call it, you know, the most important thing that we can do in our communities is create space for people to hear their stories. Dr. Chibanda, I'm sorry you cut out and that was a golden nugget. So he, he can you, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? People can actually share it. Oh gosh. I've learned. Um, can you hear me? Can you still, can you still hear me? You know what? You're, you're on and off. And this happens all the time on zoom that we get to this cliffhanger golden nugget. And <laughs> so, so we're all like, what was that? <laughs> So can we try that one more time, what you've learned? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I was, uh, you know, I was saying that um, one of the things I've learned as a psychiatrist is that it's not actually important to be a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a CBT trained therapist. The most important thing that we really need all to be able to do is create space for people to share their stories, because that's when healing starts, when people can share their stories, when people can be comfortable to feel vulnerable and share what they're going through, healing begins. And, um, you know, the other thing I've learned as well, you know, from the, from the grandmothers is uh, the most important entry point into healing is expressed empathy making people feel respected and understood yeah i i i see that i agree i i just i love that i love this um i'm going to think of all these great things and comments probably after this call <laughs> So I'm going to open it up. There's so much that I want to chew on. Um, I'm thrilled at having this particular group and these people. Um, you are really speaking our language. And I definitely want to find out, especially at the end of the call, when we before we say goodbye, I want to find out how we can help make this happen for the people that are able to, that are interested, maybe get some uh, grandmothers here in the States. Um so I, I just, I think you're onto something just so basic and so powerful at the same time. Um, so thank you. And Scott, thank do you, you have a, a question or a comment? Hey, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Dr. Jip Potter, thank you so much for uh, what you're bringing to this platform today. You know, as I was over the past week or so kind of thinking about uh, what today's show was going to be like, uh, I started thinking, you know, well, what about the grandfathers? You know, I know there's a, it's a, there's a cultural issue with this, too. But then listening to what you were saying and then kind of reflecting back in my own life, my own experience growing up as a child from a, a family that had divorced when I was very young. Uh, now, I, I had a strong grandfather, but I tell you what, my, my grandmother was amazing. Uh, my mom stayed with my brother and me. My mom's sister uh, whenever we would get together i would sit there with the women and listen to them talk and share their stories and and the faith that came with that you know the religious faith and just how they address life and the empathy part that you speak to so well you know that really resonates with why women and grandmothers in particular uh, are fantastic people to do uh, what you folks are doing over there. And, and I think culturally we need help on this end with that because uh, very different lifestyles, right? Our, our lifestyles here are, you know, everything happens quickly and that your memories and your experiences just move to the next frame. And people don't have a lot of time to reflect on what's really important. And you, you really hit the part about uh, you know empathy and people 
it's hard enough if you don't have resources, but if you don't have hope and you don't have, you know, those those strong foundational things that tie tie it together to be able to move forward uh, in life with a healthy mind and a healthy heart. Uh, yeah, grand, grandma's played such a fantastic role in that. Um, thank you for what you're doing. I One last thing. Uh, I'm, I, I should have said this up for uh, up front or asked us to do this. I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a retired Marine. I served for 20, 20 years, 21 years in the, in the uh, Marine Corps. And I've done, you know, some things with veterans and whatnot since my time uh, in the Marine Corps. But uh, just quickly, I, I shared a story last time we were talking uh, on this platform about when I was, you know, a senior Marine in charge of a lot of folks and one of my Marines had committed suicide and just the trauma that comes with that uh, for all, all the friends, certainly the family and, and, you know, for me as well, feeling that same way where, you know, there's a, there's a level of responsibility that you feel uh, because even though you tried, you know, as much as you could, it, it wasn't good enough. Uh, and then speaking with the father, uh, the, the mother was, the mother had a lot of issues and she, she actually wound up committing suicide a year later, but the father who's a policeman, him and I spoke one day after the, his son's funeral for, I don't know, six hours. Uh, it was very therapeutic for me, uh, listening to him, the, the father, and all he had to share with me uh, really helped me uh, heal from that, uh, his stories. And so, yeah, there, there's absolutely power in stories. And uh, thank you for, for what you're doing, uh, because your light is shining all the way over here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Now, Sarah, if you don't mind, I just want to touch on something that Scott um, highlighted. Scott used the word hope. And, you know, interestingly, when we talk to folks who've been through the experience with the grandmothers, although the friendship bench is about mental health, consistently what comes out when you ask people who've experienced that interaction with the grandmother is the word hope. The grandmothers have instilled hope in my life. Um, I, I know that I'm not yet out of you know, the predicament that I was in, but because I have hope, I can now address these issues. And interestingly, you know, Sarah, one of the things that we've actually started doing at the Friendship Bench is not just measure mental health outcomes, but we're measuring hope, you know, and I believe that's really what we should be measuring. You know, there's so much emphasis on, um, on, on, on clinical diagnosis, particularly in your part of the world, you know, what we really need to instill in people's lives is hope. It doesn't matter if you're suffering from bipolar affective disorder or schizophrenia or, or major depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. If we instill hope in folks, life begins to have meaning. Stop there. I mean, isn't that it? Hope. Isn't that the difference between life and death? People who go forward or people who choose to take their life, they lose hope. I mean, that's, I, I just, I love what you're bringing up because it, it just, I think that's, that's been many of the conversations we've had. Um, and I love that connecting that, that that's what the grandmas they bring or they, and it, it's about not measuring the outcome, but measuring the hope. You know, it's just you're 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 speaking common sense. You're speaking what is true, what is real for human beings, rather than uh, too much, you know, uh, book knowledge, uh, which is great. I I'm not getting on that, but you're being human. Thank you. You're being human. Um, and. Uh, I love that. Thank you so much also, Scott, for that. Um, David. So 
I love Scott to death, but I always hate going after him because he's the most profound prophetic person I've ever met next to Chris Gregorio. The two of them are tied for first. <laughs> and I'm always at a loss for exactly those two thoughts. So thanks, Scott, for screwing up my app. No, it's good. Um, <laughs> cheers, brother. <laughs> um, so, so much of what you talked about, Dr. Chabanda, is, like Sarah already said, resonates so much with us. Um, it's so in line with what we talk about and what we do and how each one of us individually within, <clears throat> excuse me, within this group uh, lead to certain aspects of their life off, off screen. Uh, the couple of things that stood out to me that were so interesting, and actually I'll go backwards because I want to just pick up where we left off with Scott's version of hope, is uh, when you talk about diagnosis versus hope, that's the modern um, conundrum, if you want to put it that, uh, between the psychology that has historically been to um, ail mental disease that has already existed versus the positive psychology which takes from zero going forward rather than coming up to zero. So, and I, I, so I find that part of it very interesting. And what you are doing obviously is very much in the realm of the positive psychology uh, framework versus a clinical psychology um, or you know a scientific approach to research. So I, I think that's super awesome. And I, honestly, I think that's where psychology is headed permanently and we can get rid of the, the science part of psychology and get into the human part of psychology. Uh, I, th I think it's going to be huge. Um, so thank you for bringing it up and thank you for that being part of the work that you do. Um, which leads me into what I've written down here. A note, modern medicine has nothing on the power of human connection. And I think that what you were doing far out, uh, outpaces anything you were going to do as a medical school student going into um, tangible medicine. Uh, so I, I, the world brings us into places that we never expected. And I, I think the world has brought you into this for a specific reason, because what the work that you're doing is, is incredibly special. Um, you also brought up the word imposter syndrome, which uh, I'm glad you did. And I never really thought of it in that way. I'm not sure I've even heard that term before. Um, I've always looked at it as almost survivor's guilt, uh, which is often something you'll see, you know, with military losses, I'm sure, you know, Scott can speak to that. Um, and on the, the law enforcement side where I come from, you can, there's suicide and uh, law enforcement losses due to adversarial circumstances where you also end up with survivor's guilt. But for me, it's been kind of on the, on the suicide front where I've had so many friends that have taken their own lives in the law enforcement world. Like, how did I survive? And what did they have that I don't and vice versa? Um, and I have taken that and push it into the work that I'm doing to try to help other police officers from stop going that route as well. Uh, but I have always felt this like hold back on, am I authentic? And when you said the words imposter syndrome, that really resonated with me. And I appreciate you phrasing it that way because I feel the same way. Like I, I, I hope that what I'm bringing to the table is authentic because obviously dead people can't teach, but they can through their experiences that we've learned. Um, and I fear that because I haven't um, been, I mean, it's not hundred percent true either, but I, I just, I hope that what we present as humans like us, that it is authentic and, you know, that we are truly healing people, even if we're not healing everybody. Um, and I think we are going to lose people along the way. And I, I think it's important that we recognize and tell those stories as you did. So I really appreciate that because we're not going to be perfect in our uh, delivery of our goals. And uh, we, there's some people we just can't reach and can't touch. And I don't think it's because of the lack of our authenticity or the lack of our ability to do so. I think just some people aren't reachable. Um, but I appreciate you talking about that because that really meant uh, a lot to me and helped me kind of reframe some of that. And I will continue to do so, do so going forward. On a less um, emotional or sexy front, um, what do you guys do to track progress? of these meetings between the elders and the people that they're helping? And what do you do to protect the program against uh, any liability where if somebody does go through the program and then ends up taking their own life? I don't know what, you know, here in, here in the United States, uh, everybody would be sued like crazy if um, you didn't have a license to sit on a bench and talk to people um, and something went wrong. 
So I'm curious if that's a thing where you are and how you guys track progress either for that reason or for other reasons. Thanks, David. Great question. Yeah, so I'll start off with how we track progress. So every time a person sits on the bench with a grandmother, we we collect what we call a baseline score. And um, that baseline score informs us um, you know, around how that person is feeling in terms of certain symptoms. You know, oftentimes when people are struggling with uh, with 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 problems, you know, they often will have challenges with sleep. Um, sometimes they will be tearful. They sometimes they will even have suicidal thoughts. You know, uh, at times they will have withdrawn from their usual activities. You know, stop going to work, stop interacting with family. You know, and um, and just really kind of presenting. You know, now moving to um, to, to to the to the clinical presentation. People will present with, say, your DSM-5 symptoms for depression, anxiety, your PTSD. We capture that at the beginning. And we also capture their sense of record. We administer those same tools. Can you all hear me? You know, it's a little spotty. We're trying, I think, trying to connect the dots. Um, so you're talking about what there's like an assessment that happens with the grandmothers, maybe to assess their mental health beforehand. Yes. Yeah, before the grandmother, you know, sort of while the grandmother is actually uh, communicating or talking to a person, you know, listening to their story and sharing her own story, she will also administer a set of tools which helps the grandmother to establish whether, for instance, someone is suicidal, uh, somebody has uh, severe symptoms of psychosis, or is, um, you know, is, is, is in a very bad space and needs to be referred. And based on the scores of those tools, we have an algorithm that we use. Uh, in fact, anyone who scores a certain number of scores on those tools is defined as a red flag. And the grandmother will normally refer a red flag to a more experienced grandmother. A more experienced grandmother is anyone who has been working at Friendship Bench for more than five years. If that person who has been working for more than five years still feels that this case cannot be managed within the Friendship Bench sort of um, program, they then refer to a psychiatrist or a trained psychologist. And so that's how we measure um, outcome. And we normally measure that at six weeks after the first session. And we measure again after six months and after one year. And so far, we have an 80% reduction in symptoms. And um, we have a significant improvement in quality of life. If you're really interested in seeing some of our more sort of scientific outputs you know, we have more than 100 peer-reviewed scientific publications, and one of our most seminal publication is actually a cluster randomized controlled trial, which is published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. You know, that is a, a very high impact journal, you know, where we carried out this randomized controlled trial. We compared grandmothers versus doctors and the grandmothers were much better at alleviating symptoms of depression, anxiety, and, um, and reducing suicidality, you know, and that is published actually in an, in an American journal. Um, and so, um, and, and you talked about um, what, what we do, how we deal with uh, issues that might, um, um, uh, that might end up with, uh, with the courts, say somebody takes their own life, um, you know, I think we've had, since I started Friendship Bench, we have had three suicides. We have had um, three suicides. Um, and, and, you know, unfortunately, you know, when these kind of things happen, you've got to have systems in place to manage them um, for the family. Uh, what I can say is fortunately, when, uh, when these suicides occurred, these were patients who had clients who had already been identified by the grandmothers as needing 
extra care and had been referred to a hospital. So the suicide occurred after they had been referred. You know, we haven't really had a suicide occurring within Friendship Bench because I think we use all these robust screening tools to identify people who are um, facing immediate risk and we try to intervene as, uh, as soon as, um, as we can. I hope I've answered your 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 um your question. Now you you talk, you touched on authenticity. Um, I learned from the grandmothers that authenticity comes when we begin to be comfortable with being vulnerable. Yes, that I I agree with that a hundred percent. Um, you know, what, one of the things that we say in both here in the, the military world and the law enforcement world um is that getting comfortable being uncomfortable is important and when you're talking about vulnerability i think that's very difficult for some of us who are standard knuckle dragging door kickers uh to do uh because we're if we're not hardened we're not going to be able to successfully complete our missions not only for ourselves but for our teams and then when the you shed the uniform after your time in it is over, it's very difficult to flip that switch and come back to being a human again. And I think vulnerability is not natural. It's something that's learned. And the process by which you are showing others how to do that, I think is so special and so important. And it definitely translates to much of the work that everybody here on this call does as well. Um, but yeah, that, that vulnerability piece and the ability to tell your story for the purposes of healing is a learned skill. And other than the experiential component to that, I'm wondering how we teach that. That's a, that's, that's a, that's a great question. So I would spend a whole hour talking about how we teach that. Um, you know, at Friendship Bench, you know, we, we teach what we do um, through uh, a series of uh, trainings. We have three training levels. Um, level one is, uh, is aimed at teaching the basic skills of listening, um, using nonverbal communication, um, um, and using empathy as a tool um, and also creating space for others to share their stories. Um, you know, so when you learn those basic skills, you become extremely efficient at interacting with other human beings, one, hum one human, other human, you know. Um, so that's level one. Level two goes on to how to actually identify, and this is where the legal aspect comes in, how to identify people who may be at risk of either harming you or others or themselves. You know, people who are suicidal, people who are psychotic, people who are, who have severe, um, you know, bipolar, uh, uh, you know, disorder, you know, whatever symptoms they may be, that is level two that we, we equip the grandmothers with level two skills. And level three skills is actually providing therapy. You know, so we 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 equip uh, folks on those three things, um, but but you know, I've also learned over the years that um, just practicing um, mindfulness, or rather, let me rephrase that: every human being, every human being has three essential pillars that define who they are. You have the mind, you have the spirit, you have the body. The mind is really more about your cognition, you know, um, and the spirit is the essence of who you are, you know, that which defines your values, that which defines your belief. It can be a Christian belief. It can be a Hindu belief, what, whatever it is. And the physical aspect is the body, you know, and you need to take care of all three at all times and uh it's critical that we are selfish at taking care of those three and i've found over the years that when you take care of those three components you generally do better 
when you are under stress, when you're dealing with other folks who might need um, help from you. You know, um, I know we're running out of time, so I'll I'll I'll, I'll stop there because I know there's still a, a question. Uh, there's a hand up there um, that we also need to give others a chance to speak. I'll stop there for now. That's beautiful. Thank you. That makes total sense to me. Um, Janet, we got a couple more minutes. Do you have a comment or yeah, a question? Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, Scott and David are amazing, and so is Sarah, so they've covered quite a bit. Uh, for myself, my background's policing. I was an emergency police dispatcher, married to a police officer, raised two children, then raised four grandchildren. So um, I'm in that category of grandmother and uh, or griot. And I'm very, very interested in how I can become a part of it. Um, you know, I'm in Canada unlike the rest of us. Uh, I'm a little north of the border and I'm very, very interested in knowing more and because that is so powerful. Just us on the power of our story here have helped each other so much by sharing our stories and listening. And I know just the other day I was on a call and uh, the I got a message later from the lady. She says, well, this conversation didn't go where I thought it was gonna go. Thank you. So, you know, we have more to us than a lot of times we even believe. And uh, uh, your intuition is amazing. I am so grateful that uh, we got you on here. And I hope you'll come back so we can learn more. Uh, but I'll leave it at that and let you answer that. So I'm very grateful you're here. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Maybe you can you can kind of get reach out after this. And um, I certainly can uh, can see how we can help you to become a griot. I certainly would love to see all of you becoming griot. I think there's a griot in every single one of us. You know, there, there really is. Um, but, you know, uh, you folks are, you know, working in a uh, in, in very difficult um, uh, professions. I mean, policing in the U.S. Uh, is, is uh, or in Canada, for that matter, is is a very challenging job, you know, at least from what I see, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a very, very difficult job. And, um, but you know, we need folks like you to do this work. Um, and, um, you know, and also being in the Marines, I have a couple of friends who have, who are, you know, in the Marines, it's not an easy thing either. Um, so bless you all for what you're doing. Bless you. Yeah. Um, over, over, over to you, Sarah. Oh, Dr. Chibanda, what an absolute pleasure and honor to have you on this call and to hear you share and to hear the stories and to hear, you know, the wisdom of, of, of using griots to give people hope. Um, like I said, you know, a lot of us, um, we had not talked about this before, but I, I lost my dad to suicide and that's why I'm doing this today too, you know, and <clears throat> pretty much everybody on this call has gone through something like that also that has changed us to really want to help other people. So Dr. Chabana, I mean, I'm telling you, we could talk for hours, but I want to be sensitive to your time. So I just want to thank you so much. Do you have any last words that you want to leave us with? Um, I think the, the only thing I'd like to, to say in conclusion is that, you know, within every single one of us is, um, is a therapist. You don't have to be a psychiatrist. You you don't have to be a psychologist. You just have to learn the basic skills of how to create space for people to share their stories. And that's when the healing starts. So that's what I'd like to encourage you all to focus on in your lives, you know, become griots in America. Oh, I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Chibanda.